But with that, what we'll do now is move on to Vanessa, who's talking about exploring Australia's IoT through a men's fashion wear brand, which I'm intrigued by because I have no idea where we're going with this. So if Vanessa's um, here and ready to share, have we given co-host rights? Just wait, I haven't got Vanessa on my screen yet to, yep, there we're good. Brilliant, so Vanessa's up and running. I'm intrigued to see how this ties in together, but I'm going to mute me. Okay, great. I think it must have been my speakers. Woo! All right. Rough. So let's kick this off. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm Vanessa, in case anyone missed that, and my topic is exploring Australia's IoT through a fashion menswear brand. So the two might not be interlinked at all, and, you know, I guess I get, I get why. Um, and before I go into that, just a little bit about myself, because I think I'm a new face in this little environment here. So I am a newbie. I have only graduated about one and a half years ago in Sydney and now in Melbourne. Um, I told myself at the start of this year, I was going to try and be brave and attend events and be part of events. So here I am, my first event I'm speaking at. Um, my background is not in IT, it's actually in arts and the theater. Um, and I only realized I was really, I really enjoyed coding about two years ago. So um, now I'm on this quest to code. Okay, so the Italian menswear fashion brand, the reason why I wanted to talk about it in IoT, in the IoT space, was in 2016, I had the amazing opportunity to go to Italy. And I'm not sure if some people have heard of this brand called Emenegildo Zenia. So that's how it's pronounced and spelled over there. Um, but when we went, we were paired up with different companies and mine was this fashion brand. And what we were to do was to try and solve and propose some solutions for the problems that they were having at the time. And some of the solutions that we came up with, and I didn't realize it at the time, was actually IoT. So that's why I thought, why not make the connection and draw the connection to how we are progressing in the Australian environment as well. So let's continue. This was the problem statement that was given by Emenegil Dozenia. So they are a first world brand and they provide an extreme luxury experience. If you remember from the previous slide here, it looks like a museum. It's very intimidating. It's beautiful. It's like, I can't even look at it because I can't afford it. Um, and their issue here is 60% of the shoppers leave without making a purchase. And Xenia wants to understand why these 60% actually leave and how we can convert these potential browsers into buyers. So what our team did was go, why don't we utilize the power of data and try and you know, create an experience for the sales manager to understand the customer as quickly as possible as they walk through the door. So, solution. Imagine you're this customer, you're a lawyer. Um, this is actually my friend. I should have photoshopped myself in there instead. Um, the customer experience wouldn't change for you. So before and after, nothing would look quite different. Everything in the IoT solution presented here would be embedded into the store. Cool. So I hope you can just follow me and bear with me. Um, if you walk into the store, what will happen is a sensor would be placed outside of the Xenia store or at the door of the store and it would register Aaron's gate. Gate is the someone's walk. So that's why you've got the gate ID registered to that person. Now, the gate ID then creates a unique user identification, which where the start of your IoT journey begins. Um, and then we can start a timer with Aaron's journey and customer journey um, in the store. So next, I, I know I should have photoshopped myself in there, but that's Aaron. So on the left, you can see a visual of the new user interface a sales associate would be able to see. This is all hypothetical as well. Um, Aaron, in this case, has never shopped in Xenia. All the sales associate can view is the newly created gate ID, which has a unique identifier. However, over the course of Aaron's journey, more fields will populate with information. So one of the other aspects that we proposed in this solution was that in the front of the store, you have some sort of facial expression recognition software that measures someone's face as they walk past the store. Now, this is how you get the idea of content, who looks at the store, who's peeking, why are they looking, or are they just staring you know, out of for no reason? Um, 
The next bit of this experience would be the Wi-Fi password. Now, some people already know that this is a really good trick of the trade with any store. If you go in, you start clicking login with Facebook, they can immediately draw all that information from you. So I suppose trick of the trade is if you don't want that information um, to be taken, don't sign in with your login Facebook. Um, but if you do, a store can collect where you're from, what you do for work and your name. Now, there's something called an accelerometer, and this is a tiny little device. It looks like a pie. Um, and we were thinking, if you put this onto a hanger, you can measure the acceleration of a hanger when someone touches clothes. So this is part of the whole IoT experience again. Once you walk into the store, you have idea of what facial expressions they have and how they interact with the things in the store around them. Therefore, giving you an idea of what is popular, what are people intrigued by? Is it the material? Is it the clothes? Um, so this brings me to the whole IoT device solution. As I got into the IT world, what I realized was this is actually a really cool and possible solution. The only thing was the reaction we got from the executives from Emenejo Luzenia is, oh my goodness, isn't this a privacy breach of people? And the second thing is, isn't it cost expensive and does the software exist? So there's two sides of the coin here, and this is how I'm gonna relate it back to Australia and really on a global scale. When we think about IoT, there are some parts of it, for example, in retail that would definitely breach some parts of privacy. So if you've heard in the news, the facial recognition software right now is a huge, huge debate just because there's not enough cybersecurity law to surround and cup that. Um, full disclosure here, um, this is actually a Microsoft um, picture, but the concepts that I'm explaining here would apply to AWS and Google and everywhere else. I am just familiar with the Microsoft um, software, which is why I've put this here. So if we think about all the touch points that I mentioned before, the hanger, the facial recognition, the way some uh, Aaron walks or his gait, those are all public endpoints. Um, and the issue with the public endpoints here, when it, when it travels on a VPN, as most people would know on this call, is it's publicly it's, it's threatened basically by someone being able to jump on it and go like, oh, look, information. And this is the problem of opportunity with IoT. To set it up, you have to get all the sensory data and all the software set up and available. Second, you've got to actually install all of these mini endpoints everywhere. And to do this on a large scale, for example, of agriculture, how much money would you have to fund into an initiative like that. So by trialing and testing, there's quite a huge margin that you'd have to meet before you could even do something like that. And if you just look at this picture, it is not protective of the VPNs. So it needs to look something like this probably if you're actually going to implement it. Um, full disclosure, it's also a Microsoft thing, but I'm pretty sure AWS and Google have something similar as well. <laughs> I am just familiar with how this works. Um, so, as I wrap up my presentation, what I really wanted to say was the reasons why it might be quite a huge, um, almost like a little hurdle for most governments and um, to actually enter into the market really with IoT is that network isolation by preventing connectivity exposure to public internet is something that's not exactly easiest to do. And to do that on a large scale makes it all the more tricky. Um, enabling private connectivity for your experience is really hard. And people are still trying to do that now. And COVID-19 doesn't make that any easier now that people have to move from you know, in-office collaboration into remote spaces. So, the idea of IoT is now trialed and tested with us being having to, you know, go onto our own VPNs and go into work. But how can this keep going onto a larger scale? And at what point in this adventure can we actually start to implement the solutions? So while it's all very exciting and the details that I talked about with the Emenegildo Xenia could be a reality, a lot of the laws that we have at the moment do not quite meet the expectation before we can actually deploy. And the other part is, it is so much cost. 
In the future, we can probably get the census costs at a lower rate, but for now, it's a little bit too high or the hurdle is high. Um, so yeah, one really cool initiative. Um, I was talking about the agricultural side of things as well. And it, did you know in Victoria, we do have a $12 million initiative with on-farm of Internet of Things with trial. The reason why I didn't bring this up earlier is also because this is on pause because of our friend COVID-19. A um, little bit hard to get farmers out there to you know, be on this trial if we are all indoors and communication is particularly difficult. But um, people are thinking about this. And the Australian government, they are thinking about this. And I think the main issue right now is the cybersecurity because no one wants to end up in the newspapers. And I work with government on a day-to-day -day basis, and that is their prime and be all. And they want to protect our data, which is awesome. Um, but how do we move forward if we're going to make such huge leaps and bounds in IoT? And I suppose that's my big question of the day. Um, thank you for this. Oh, uh, I've covered that. But yes, thank you for listening to me. And thank you for being my first audience. Vanessa, no one would have picked that that was your first tech talk. I'm blown away, um, like seriously blown away. So welcome to tech is the first thing I'd like to say. Um, and we're glad you came here with us.